Welcome, everybody. I hope you can hear me. My name is Salim Bayankor, and I am very pleased to welcome all of you on behalf of the Baha'i International Community. Welcome to this event, the media, the narrative, the people, and their leaders, hosted by the uh, Baha'i International Community's United Nations office, which uh, we'll see four journalists considering how the stories we tell shape the world that we live in. The BIC recently explored the challenges uh, confronting us when we try to implement policies that can benefit all. Shortfalls in our scientific understanding of problems, social barriers, economic forces of both intentional and emergent financial interests, prevailing conceptual blocks regarding human nature and the social order, structures of governance, capacity limitations and integrity issues all inhibit leaders, communities and individuals from pursuing positive change. Today, we will look at the role of the media and how the media can play a positive role in creating consensus, building unity, generating knowledge and shared understandings, and how in doing so, the media can help us to solve real problems. The Baha'i writings advance this understanding of the media when they say, the pages of swiftly appearing newspapers are indeed the mirror of the world. They display the doings and actions of the different nations. They both illustrate them and cause them to be heard. Newspapers are as a mirror endowed with hearing, sight, and speech. They are a powerful phenomenon and a great matter, but it behooves the writers and editors thereof to be sanctified from the prejudices of egotism and desire, and to be adorned with the ornament of equity and justice. They must acquire into matters as fully as possible in order that they may be informed of the real facts and commit the same to writing. The four journalists joining us today all have experience in working toward this understanding of how the media can work and what this evolution of the media, this vision of the media can do for the world. I'm very pleased to introduce our four panelists today who will uh, each address these questions for 45 minutes to an hour and then we will have some space for everybody joining us today to, uh, to also ask questions of the panelists. So we will open with Temeli Tianmei, our lead in speaker who has worked as a television journalist with local and international news outlets across Hong Kong and Malaysia before she took a PhD in anthropology from the University of Hong Kong. She is currently engaged in postdoctoral research with the Institute for Studies in Global Prosperity. Amanda Ripley is an investigative journalist for The Atlantic and many other publications, including Time, where her work helped the magazine to win two national magazine awards. She is the author also of several books, most recently including High Conflict which explores how human beings have become captured by destructive and polarized forms of conflict in contemporary society and what some people are doing to leave this form of conflict behind. Nwandi Lawson is a former journalist of CNN, Turner Broadcasting and Georgia Public Broadcasting and is now the chief cultivation officer for the Virtues Collective, a communications consultancy that works to develop peace, purposefulness and productivity for its clients. Nwandi was also a recipient of the Georgia Women of Achievement and Southern Regional Emmy Awards. And we are also being joined by Janet Abina Koinu, a former journalist with Ghana Broadcasting Corporation and a founder of Ghana's Save a Street Child Foundation. She also won both the Ghana Journalists Association Award in 2019 and the Safe Water Supply Award in 2020 for her work on humanitarian issues and local development across Ghana. So with that, I'm very pleased to ask Tamili to say a few more remarks to open and then I will uh, very gently moderated discussion with uh, everybody on the panel asking some questions across all and uh, and then we'll open to the floor. So, Temely, thank you so much. Hi everyone, it's really exciting to be here with all of you, especially such a wonderful panel of journalists. Um, I thought to kick us off in our conversation today that I might share some broad observations um, that I've experienced both working as a journalist in Hong Kong and Malaysia, but also living in mainland China and the US. Um, so the quote that Salim shared earlier about uh, newspapers being a mirror to the world is really kind of how I see the role of media and journalists. Um, think of a giant satellite dish that isn't a satellite dish, but a mirror, and it doesn't really have a base. And journalists are the people kind of holding up that mirror in different societies. So you kind of, you can angle the mirror towards the sky, towards the sun, towards the mountain, towards the earth. And it's a constant sort of negotiation um, by all the sort of journalists and media actors um, to kind of decide where to point this giant mirror. Um, and each one of these individuals working in media uh, in the different contexts are moral actors who think it should be kind of pushed this way or that way. And taken together across all the sort of local and national contexts, 
it's a bit like a disco ball that shows us what the world really is. But I think in our sort of mini bubbles, we only know that tiny round piece of mirror that we're angling around. Um, so that's kind of how I think of the role of media in shaping narrative. Um, so when we talk about political will, I think we don't really use the term in reference to an individual. It usually refers to collective groups coming together to work towards social change in some shape or form. But oftentimes what we mean by the collective is sort of not made explicit and in fact rests on the assumptions of what we think the individual is. And so when you look at human interest stories, for example, which focus on the individual, the narrative usually goes that it's the individual in service to the collective or the individual in spite of the collective or some kind of combination of the two. And so that gives us insight into what our assumptions of the individual actually are. Um, and then within these contexts of the collective, you've got power that is held up to be sacred, whether monarchy, whether constitution, whether constitutional monarchy. And then within these contexts, you've got a really wide spectrum of media, whether state owned media or whether um, fully privatized or independent media. And depending on the context, you've got citizen journalists um, who see their role as being the opposite of you know, state-run uh, media organizations. And I think within all these contexts, um, individual journalists face very different ethical challenges. And perhaps the first step in building unity or shared understanding is awareness of how these broader forces um, shape media and the individual uh, journalists. And I think this is really important because um, this is what determines whether our narrative of humanity is a reactive one or whether it's sort of a conscious advancing one involving you know, a wider and wider spectrum of humanity. And so I thought I'd share these observations to kick off our conversation. Thank you so much, Timely. I think it's uh, it's very important to to think about these questions of the the, the collective as opposed to just the individual and uh, and also the forces that are operating uh, when we think about such broad questions as the role of the media and society and, and advancing something like a, a positive notion of of uh, constructive political will. So uh, Amanda, if I could uh, start with you, please. Your your recent book High Conflict explores uh, exactly this question of of how polarization takes away the ability of people and communities. Uh, it takes away their ability to find common ground and uh, to address shared challenges. So do you mind speaking to, to this understanding of what's, what's happening in contemporary society, in many parts of contemporary society, and then also uh, in particular through this book, how you've used your role as a journalist to explore more constructive alternatives? Thank you. Yeah, it's good to be here. It's good to see you all. And I'm grateful for the chance to talk about um, big and difficult ideas like this. Um, so about five years ago, I found myself sort of in a quandary because I didn't know how to be useful as a journalist anymore. Um, it just felt like journalism was really important, but it wasn't having the impact it once had. And it was very obvious that trust was more important than the facts. Um, and that fear was more important than the facts. Uh, and so I went off to try to learn from people who understand conflict intimately, including, you know, uh, diplomats and psychologists and gang violence interrupters and uh, ministers, all, all kinds of people. And what I learned pretty quickly was that the problem isn't conflict, right? We need conflict in our societies to get better, to be pushed, to defend ourselves, right? Um, the, the problem is the kind of conflict. And in the US and other countries, the kind of conflict we're seeing is a special category of conflict, which I call high conflict. There are other terms of art for it, like intractable conflict. But in that state, which is basically when conflict escalates to a point where it takes on its own reality, where it's usually an us versus them kind of feud um, everything gets very clear for both sides. It feels very clear. There's a sense of moral superiority on one side or the other, if not both. Um, and there is increasingly a tendency to make a lot of mistakes. So we always make mistakes as humans, right? But all of our normal biases are heightened in, at this level of high conflict because we feel perpetually threatened. Um, and sometimes we are physically threatened and sometimes we're not, but it still feels that way. So 
different rules apply. Um, any intuitive thing you do in high conflict, including as a journalist, will probably backfire, has been my experience. So then what? So then you have to do the counterintuitive thing and you have to do it really carefully. Um, but it helps to understand the psychology of human beings in group conflict, or else you're just uh, you're just going to be probably making things worse, even as a journalist, even if you don't intend that. And some people do. <laughs> some people do intend that. Some people are actually conflict entrepreneurs uh, in in journalism, and there are conflict entrepreneurs, social media platforms, um, who really exploit conflict for their own ends, right? Um, and we can talk more about that if you want, but most people, I think it's fair to say, most journalists um, are not intentionally exploiting conflict, but often they are exploiting it anyway. <laughs> and some of that is not understanding conflict dynamics. Um, and there are other reasons too, but that's just for me, it was very helpful to understand that um, in high conflict, different rules apply. Than, than in healthy conflict. And what you want is to make that shift, right? From high conflict to healthy conflict. And, and political will is a big part of that, right? Thank you, Amanda. And so I think uh, just uh, if, if you could also uh, tell us a bit about how it was that you came to appreciate what the counterintuitive thing would be to do. Uh, and, uh, and then also, uh, as you say, what role does that counterintuitive thing um, whatever it'll turn out to be, what role does that play in, in helping society move towards a form of, uh, of, of maybe starting to understand each other, people, different groups in society starting to understand each other. Um, the, the notion of political will as being something that isn't created through adversary, but through consultation. Yes, which naturally leads me to explain how I ended up in touch with Nwandi and eventually with you all. Uh, so while I was working on this, book, my obsession, right, was trying to find communities that were cultivating good conflict on purpose and sometimes succeeding. So we could see the difference because so much of political will is a failure of imagination in my experience. So people, what journalists can do, if they can do anything, is to help people see and visualize and imagine another way. Um, because there is a sense of fatalism, right, that kicks in, uh, particularly in, in conflict. So in doing that, I was everyone I met with, I would ask, is there any, you know, institution or place that you know of that does conflict differently? And uh, a journalist colleague of mine, Jennifer Brandel, mentioned the Baha'is, who I have to admit I knew nothing about. Um, and so I started learning and reaching out and talking, interviewing people like Nwandi, uh, who very generously sort of uh, tutored me a bit in consultation and some of the other um, rituals and uh, mindsets, right, um, of the Baha'i community. And it was like, oh, okay, here's an example of essentially doing politics differently. I know you may not think of it as politics, but for me to see a community of people try to make decisions and organize itself is, is politics, right? Um, and doing that in a way that is intentionally designed to reduce the power of the ego and continually expand the definition of us seems to me to counter a lot of the problems we have in our normal secular politics, which do the opposite, right? Which ritualistically, systematically raise up the ego and divide right, and keep crystallizing that sense of us versus them. So um, that would be an example of, of something that is counterintuitive, right, that in conflict, we really tend to want to be uh, authoritative, and we tend to allow the ego to, to lead, um, or fear to lead. And so one way to, to counterintuitively go into conflict, right, is to get very curious, right when we're sure we know, right when we're filled with judgment, to cultivate curiosity is probably the most magical power I have seen. I don't always, I frequently fail at it. Um, and it is something that uh, you can make easier, I think, depending on the design of your, you know, space and, and institution.
Thank you, Amanda. That's very interesting. And, uh, and maybe this is a good time to bring Nwandi to bring you into the discussion. And I think many people on this call will be familiar with some of the uh, Baha'i principles around the importance of consultation, for example, and, uh, and removing the ego from that consultation uh, in order to arrive at uh, the truth and to be able to make a, a collective decision on any given matter. Um, and, uh, and, and we can uh, look at what Amanda found in her work as well, if that's uh, constructive for the call. But I think uh, what's especially, and maybe Nwanda, you can touch on that, uh, but I think what would especially be interesting to hear from both you, Nwanda, and, and you, Amanda, is how the interaction between you, the, the relationship that you built, is itself a, a case study in the role the media plays in, in promoting uh, positive forms of, uh, of interaction and social change and, and uh, the building of consensus, the creation of, of shared understanding and shared knowledge. Yes, well, I, I, you know, I was really fascinated listening to what Amanda was sharing about this idea of, you know, failure of imagination and, and its role in actually, you know, continuing high conflict. Um, her book, of course, helps us to track various forms of conflict from those that exist at the level of the community to those that might be at the level of a, of a nation and, and so on and so forth, those that are formally political and those that are outside of the political process. But I think what's interesting is you know, if you think about the two of us meeting each other in the way that she was describing and then just sharing ideas, which at the heart of it is what journalism is, right? It's the exchange of knowledge and ideas. I always tell people in my profession, I'm not an expert in anything. There are many people who have focused on a very uh, you know, particular line of work and they do it with excellence and they completely go down the line on that. I actually am not an expert at anything, but I'm deeply curious about many things. And so I often get to dig very deeply into a variety of different subjects. So Amanda, of course, was, was, was looking for these um, solutions. And so as a journalist, we get to ask a, a lot of questions. And I think the idea of the press that was fascinating to me when I actually encountered the Baha'i faith myself at the end of 1999. I was in Cameroon actually uh, visiting people and also trying to do some work with Cameroonian radio and television. In any case, when people began telling me about the Baha'i faith, I was fascinated by the idea that there was actually a world religion that placed the role of the press as being significant to the advancement of civilization. And it specifically said that the, the press was, was responsible for contributing to the consultative processes of society. And so then, you know, I, I, of course, at that particular time, I didn't really understand much about what that meant. But as I've tried to learn more and understand more and be able to continue to practice the, 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 the craft and the profession of collecting and sharing stories, asking lots of questions, I've been intrigued by the idea that like in Baha'i consultation, the aim is to get the views of all of the people and to be able to use that in the search for what is truth, what is the best solution for our, for our society, for our, our, you know, even at the level of the family or at the level of the community. So then if the press has a responsibility for that, I think one, one element as far as coming up with uh, a, a constructive form of political will, would include the fact that the, the press has language and it has the ability to use precision in how it communicates something in a way that might encourage the voices of, of many to be included, but also raise the level of this, uh, this imagination that, that Amanda was, was referencing, right? So for instance, you know, journalists actually have a responsibility and sometimes it's difficult because journalists also have deadlines, journalists also have financial constraints and all sorts of things. But at the bottom line, um, a journalist has a responsibility for trying to bring clarity. And sometimes clarity doesn't mean parroting something that you just heard even though you know, this is at least one vision of what is true. And the actual requirement as far as trying to convey something in, in language that brings clarity might enable us to you know, question things. Like for instance, what is an activist judge? So we repeat that a lot. We did at a certain point, it's not so popular right now, it'll come back again. But in any case, an activist judge can just mean someone who did not find in my favor, right? And so in that case, that act that, that's considered activism. I was on uh, talking to a colleague recently who was referring to a group of people as anti-vaxxers. And so I asked the question though, are they part of a movement to remove vaccinations 
or are they people who just don't choose right now to get a vaccination? Because to, to, to give someone such a label doesn't seem very precise to me. And if I were to know of someone under such a mantle as that, I would assume that they have a structure, an organization. They are doing something to dismantle vaccinations. When in fact, I think what my colleague was describing was some people that, you know, for various reasons, they have some trepidations about the COVID vaccine. So I think as journalists, part of our, our role in uh, maybe contributing to constructive political will is even as we hear politics maybe being conveyed in a way that kind of reduces itself to slogans and, and, and kind of sound bites, we might just ask a few more questions and ourselves try to convey something in a spirit that is actually more clear. And that often requires us to talk to people who maybe aren't the usual experts. But I mean, you know, certainly Amanda in, in approaching what she was trying to uncover, she had a lot of different paths she could have gone on. And talking to someone who used to belong to a, a gang and talking to people who were in politics and talking to an individual who belongs to a faith community didn't necessarily meet the criteria for all of the usual down the line experts in conflict. So I, I think one of the one of the roles that the that the media, that the press can always play is we do have a lot of control over who we select to bring into the conversation and the clarity with which we, we try to convey what it is that we're hearing in the conversation. Thank you, Nandi. Yes, I think this, this, uh, these, these points about uh, the language and clarity and precision and, uh, and also the posture, the intent of, the, of anybody who's working as a journalist uh, is very important. And uh, before I ask Temley a particular question about, uh, about the, the media traditions that go beyond the Anglo-Saxon or the Western uh, sphere, uh, I think I'd like to ask all three of you about the, uh, this, this question of intentionality uh, as, as journalists. You know, Amanda, you, you spoke about how most journalists are not uh, conflict entrepreneurs. Um, but uh, I think what Nwandi is saying also uh, reminds us that many other journalists are not conflict entrepreneurs, but they are also simply caught up in the, in the norms and, the, uh, and the, the, the forces and the structures in which they work, whether those are defined by, by commercial interests or whether those are def uh, defined by uh, what is prevailing in common. Um, and I think this question of being uh, very uh, deliberate and very intentional and very conscious as a journalist is one of the differentiators perhaps that uh, helps us understand how the media plays a more, more proactively positive role. In, in lifting the, 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 the quality of, of discourse, for example, or, or moving a, a community towards consensus. So maybe because, Temely, we haven't heard from you much, we could start with you, and then we'll, we'll ask the others the same question about intentionality. And then we can also start talking about uh, media beyond uh, simply the West. So Temely, please. Well, when it comes to the question of intentionality, I, you know, I was in journalism school just about a decade ago. And at the time, there was so much change happening in the media that the re I remember my professors would actually tell us, most of you will not get a job in media. That's just the reality of it, right? Jobs were significantly reducing and out of the class of maybe 30, 40 of us, only like five worked in journalism for some time. And many have since taken on different career paths. But I feel like the intention of going in with like contributing to the common good or helping society advance, like that was the most thrilling part of being in a room full of journalists, especially in journalism school. But the realities afterward kind of changed. For me personally, um, I started off working in, in local TV news where you're kind of dealing with, you know, murders and fires and weather issues and all of that. It was really exciting. It's like a front row seat to how a community was changing. Um, but you had very little say working in this giant system over the kinds of stories you wanted to highlight. There simply were not enough resources or time to allow you to tell broader stories. And in fact, the, the daily grind was telling stories of conflict. It was camp A versus camp B, so-and-so says this, so-and-so says that. And there's this assumption that conflict is the process through which society advances. So if there's no conflict, then we're all just kind of stagnating. And there seems to be that assumption. And so after doing that for a couple of years in like different contexts, I started to wonder like, 
where is the space in which I can actually try and change the perspective? I kind of felt like the editors dictate your stories and then you just go do it. Um, and so through a whole process of you know soul searching and questioning, like, do I want to be an agent of highlighting conflict or did I come into this profession hoping to be an agent of unity? Idealistic as that may sound. I remember in journalism school, they're like, oh, that's too idealistic. Maybe this is not the right you know space to be thinking that way. Um, but that was really my motivation. Um, and after a couple of years, so I realized that um, many of our media environments highlight what is, and they don't necessarily direct you towards other worldviews. So you're kind of in a bubble and what you're describing in the reality of media and the narrative that you have of humanity is within a particular worldview. And so I became very curious about those who are not included in this worldview, alternative communities, alternative societies who organize themselves completely differently. So um, whereas Amanda's experience was to kind of look globally for these different examples, I went down the path of studying indigenous communities who historically um, organized a way of life that rejected nonviolence and aggression and have their own art of consultation. And in my particular case, this was an indigenous community in Malaysia. Um, and, you know, you don't hear about them in the media, even within the context of their own, you know, state or country, people don't know about them or their way of life. But I dedicated, you know, five years of my life, like understanding their way of life. And I feel like these alternative marginal perspectives perhaps should be included. And what are some of the spaces in media that their dignity will be honored and they won't be treated as, you know, less than for not being part of our dominant worldview. But I feel like these communities have a lot to teach us. But I think it takes sort of that journalist with very clear intentions and sort of to see with clarity, like, okay, I wanted to do this, but this path is leading me this way. How do I sort of catch myself, bring me back to sort of my intention of serving society through media and of cultivating a more conscious, inclusive narrative of the world? Um, in a sense, you know, it comes to the qualities of what does it take to be a global citizen so that your national context isn't shaping how you view the entire world. Because I don't know if this is gonna to come to your next question for me, Salim, but I feel like a lot of times, our national worldview or perspective is mapped onto the world. And I see this often being in Asia where sort of the North American media world starts being imposed onto um, contexts in which a lot of the dynamics don't really play out. Like for example, the debate on race in America right now is so meaningful, but it's very distinctly American. And when you've got American media and the language used by American media now imposed in contexts where there is racism, absolutely, but the dynamics and context and binaries of it um, don't work in quite the same way, um, we can lead to the lack of clarity rather than to precision as Mondi was saying. Thank you, Tamley. That is very interesting, and and we'll certainly come back to the the, the some of the experiences around uh, media in uh, in 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 Asia, different parts of Asia. Um, I think uh, I think we would uh, it would also be great to just hear from uh, Amanda about uh, intentionality as a journalist and and Wandi. And uh, I know I know that maybe the two of you have uh, have some insights together on this. If you want to uh, to trade some insights in that way, and then I think we'll we'll move the conversation on as well to. Uh, also include Janet um, in, uh, in some of the uh, considerations around these questions. Yeah, so interesting, right? It's like, where do you train the camera lens? Um, it's such a big part of the challenge. Um, and by the way, I don't know if you can hear it, but I wanna apologize because I found out five minutes before this that a piano tuner was coming to our house. So I apologize if you hear a piano. Um, <laughs> Anyway, music is an important part of peacemaking. Um, so uh, yeah, where we train the lens, I think about that a lot. Like I wish in my head that we could have a wall of TV screens that was like actually representative of what's actually happening um, all over the world or in a given, even a given city would be really hard to do. Just visually, it would be so much to take in and most of it would be nothing like nothing is happening, right? But it has gotten tangled up in our heads about what the news is and what the news is as it is covered. Um, and this came up in a story I was doing for The Atlantic recently where uh, Scripps, a TV broadcast company here in the States is trying actively to change how, how it covers certain things, especially crime and fear-based stories, which is a big, Deal. As Tamalee was pointing out, a lot of local TV news coverage has historically 
stoked a lot of fear of one another of people of color and it, it's a deep deep problem in in uh in journalism but what they found is so for example this one station in ohio stopped covering non-fatal shootings unless there was it was indicative of a bigger trend or there was some importance to the story beyond the actual fact that someone got shot at two in the morning at this place and um younger viewers really liked it older viewers were really upset they felt like suddenly they they were being the news was being hidden from them um, and that it was part of an agenda right to to manipulate um, and so you get into this trap where you train <laughs> unintentionally or intentionally people get trained to see the news as a certain thing. And when you try to change that, if there's not a lot of trust already there, which there isn't at least here and in many places, then it is uh, very hard to change. Um, and the same with, they stopped covering uh, vacant house fires. This is a, another classic local TV news story. So you see a picture of a house on fire and it's you know emotionally salient but has no particular meaning necessarily for uh, you know there was no one in there no one was hurt um no particular meaning for the community but it's an easy thing to cover and it provokes emotion right and if you stop doing that people feel like you're hiding something so it's a process it's an iterative process and it, it requires though this this pre-existing trust um and how do you get that is such a million dollar question right Thank you, Amanda. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. On. No, I was just going to say I was going to add to this. The 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 idea of intentionality is uh, is drawing to mind for me a conversation that's been going on the last couple of days among uh, African American colleagues of mine that worked together at CNN in the early '90s, and we began working on um, an incident that occurred in about 1994, where uh, there was a series called Kids and Crime. And if you all remember the 90s, some of you are too young to remember them, but they were a time when the narrative focused a lot on uh, the idea that uh, Black men were an endangered species, that the war on drugs was going to need to be waged, and, and partially the, the mass incarceration that we now have many stories about was, was, was fueled by, by these stories. So CNN was not immune from being part of the society at the time, and it produced a multi part series, Kids in Crime, which almost entirely focused on African-American and a couple of Latinos as far as being the source of kids contributing to crime. And in fact, the conclusion of this particular series was, was almost horrifying from a, from a, if you think about it, from a journalistic versus an entertainment standpoint, in that they interviewed a young uh, teenager who had been uh, accused of murder. And he was speaking about the crime with very great deal of flippancy. Maybe if we had a little more compassion and looked deeply into the story, he was suffering from some trauma himself, but we didn't explore that in the story. And instead by the last part, we zoomed into his lips, which were laughing and letterboxed it and faded to black. Okay, so black uh, journalists in the CNN newsroom came together at all different levels from the highest level to the lowest level. And I mention this because of intentionality. Sometimes the story is what everyone gets to see. That's the news you read, the news that you see, the social media in your feed. But sometimes the intentionality occurs behind the scenes. And so we were reflecting on the fact that due to the fact that we took the opportunity to speak to management in a lot of meetings, but then taking it upon ourselves, we volunteered and created a, a video called Through the Lens, which someone was kind enough to repost a few days ago. It stands the test of time, even though it was created in 1994. But here's a chance for journalists to take a look at how, what do we select? Why did we place that image there? Why do we associate poverty with this particular image? How do we speak of such things? And really to question for ourselves. And one of the things I've been thinking about intentionality is that was 1994. I don't see so much of that happening in newsrooms today. And even the fact that the management, while you know, those who contributed as producers and so forth, did so on our voluntary time, there were resources put forth by the organization, by CNN, so that we could cover this issue from an international and domestic perspective 
and really make it uh, available to our colleagues, the idea that there, there, there could be more intention. So I think that from within the industry itself, as well as what it is that we're conveying outside, that, that sense of intentionality really has to be raised if we want to con uh, contribute to constructive political will. Thank you so much. And I, I believe Janet is, uh, is, is with us now too. So uh, Janet, uh, Kainu from, from Ghana, it would be wonderful to, uh, to hear from you as well, please, about uh, this, this idea of what is the intention of uh, the journalists in society. And I know from your work that you've uh, very uh, deliberately, very intentionally uh, worked on humanitarian issues that perhaps uh, you felt needed to be better understood. And I think if you're able to, to say something to the, uh, to the question of uh, how can a journalist arrive at uh, being more deliberate uh, in, in the role that they play, playing a more positive role very deliberately, uh, we'd like to learn from you on those points as well. Janet, I hope you can hear me. If uh, if you can uh, message us when when you're able to speak, then it would be great to hear hear from you. Uh, in the meantime, uh, Temely, perhaps we can uh, learn a bit more from what you were saying about uh, the, uh, the 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 experience of working as a as a journalist in in Hong Kong that you were talking about in in Malaysia, um, and, and how I, I know from my experience as a as a journalist in in past uh, lives in in Europe that. Obviously, the British press is is, is notoriously feral. Um, that's my personal experience. That's not the uh, necessarily the diagnosis of, uh, of of my colleagues, but uh, it's it's a very vigorous press. And uh, uh, whereas in other parts of the continent, we see much more consensual, much more deliberative uh, forms of media. And so it would be interesting to hear also what you've understood uh, of how the media can work in a society um, in, uh, in 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 Asia. Uh, and, and what uh, you were talking about, uh, forms of the media practice in, in different contexts being imposed uh, on work there. And so, so what, what you've learned around some of these questions. Thanks. Sorry, I was moving around a bit. My connection was a bit unstable. I think I found a place now where it's um, stable. Um, okay, so some observations of what I've learned. I feel like we're coming back to the question of trust here, because I feel like in societies that are more collectivist, there are certain unshakable assumptions around trust in institutions of governance and that then shapes media practices. So for example, um, having lived and worked in both Hong Kong and mainland China, you see different media cultures developing. Of course, that's changing. I'm talking about what I saw about a decade ago. Um, whereas in China, the media functions to advance um, a common vision, and that's very much its explicit purpose. So where are our plans as a society? Where are we advancing towards? And you know, how far have we come in achieving our goals uh, in relation to particular policies? That's sort of the expectation of state-owned media in that context. And people don't see any problem with it. Um, it's people who've left that context who then buy into a sort of like a more critical approach where it's about focusing on what's not said rather than what's said. Um, and of course, both these processes are important, but I think within the context of China um, that I saw, um, there is an acceptance that the role of media is in building trust and unity and telling us an evolving picture of society. Whereas I think in societies where the assumption is there must be conflicts for social change to happen, the role of media and citizen journalists, etc., cetera, um, is to challenge the dominant narrative. And I think the question of then how do we build trust is one worth asking in all our different contexts, because as we know, both of these are, are important. Um, but I think this version of media, you know, the folks who think conflict is necessary think that version of media is not okay and that's a form of brainwashing and from that perspective they see you know the sort of conflict driven media perspective as one that sows seeds of disunity and ultimately doesn't advance society and so how do we sort of rec reconcile these two uh, positions is a question worth asking um, within the different societies and contexts that we live in um, because I think if the idea is to build unity, shared understanding, shared consensus, both these approaches need to be recognized in their value and somehow like harmonized um, in, in service of the collective good. Um, in Malaysia, for example, independent media and citizen journalists are really important, um, play a really important role, um, but the spaces within which they can function is very limited. So it's all online because on the internet, there's freedom of speech, there's no censorship. 
but in all other broadcast media, it's, it's state controlled and there are very clear lines around what can or can't be said. Um, so citizen journalists are seen by the mainstream as sort of vigilantes. Um, and so who gets access to press conferences is even a question. Sometimes citizen journalists or independent journalists are not welcome in certain spaces. And so your access to what kinds of stories you can tell, what kind of institutions you can interview, you know, um, is all a, a process of negotiation. Um, yeah, those are some initial thoughts. Thank you so much, Tanali. So I think that opens actually some very interesting considerations that we can look at uh, together before we start moving into the questions. So this is uh, just to to bring us back out to the to the more bird's eye view for for a moment, uh, because we've looked at uh, some of the experiences that all of you have had. We've looked at some of the uh, the postures and roles of journalists individually, and uh, and now I think it would be worth uh, reflecting uh, again about how the media, when perhaps trying to take a more deliberate and a more deliberative approach, uh, more oriented towards building consensus and, and uh, creating processes of, of consultation and removing conflict. How will this kind of, uh, of a dynamic uh, operating in, in any given society um, change the nature of, uh, of governance, do we think? Uh, how, how can it change the outcome of, uh, of the relationship between our leaders and our institutions and our communities and, and us individuals? And, uh, and, and how can the, the media facilitate that, that sort of exchange to perhaps uh, as, as this uh, event is, is, is looking at overall, uh, generate the kind of, of unity of, of thought and the kind of uh, shared focus in a society that would allow us to overcome some of the great challenges that we all, that we all see. Because obviously as, as uh, Amanda has uh, said um, at the beginning and as she uh, looks at extensively in her, her, her work, uh, it is polarization and division that takes away the ability of communities and people to actually overcome challenges and to start to solve problems. Uh, so uh, if we could think about how do uh, how does a media plays a role in the, in the more uh, constructive way that, that all of you have outlined, how can we, uh, how can this address issues of governance? Um, Amanda, please, if you would like to start us off there. Sure. I mean, I think maybe at this point it's useful to get a little more um, tangible and you know, one, one example that comes to mind is um, there are people innovating all over the world, right, in, in media and doing really cool things. It's often at the local level, at least here in the States, but um, that doesn't take away from the power. In fact, it's probably more powerful because at least here, and I suspect in many places, local news media is the only trusted, to the degree it's trusted at all, uh, local, local media is more trusted. Um, so, uh, so an example of this would be there's an organization actually that Jennifer Brandel started that I mentioned who told me about the Baha'i community called Harken, H-E-A-R-K-E-N, that um, uses software and training to help newsrooms systematically listen to their audiences, solicit their ideas, their questions. So sort of close the gap, right, between the institution and the public, which we know is one really powerful way, not easy, but powerful way to rebuild some trust, whether it's closing the gap between the government and the public, right, or the media and the public, but the, to the degree you can bring those, those two groups closer, um, you have a chance to create a sense of agency, and uh, that is a really often missing from a lot of journalism, I think, today, is a sense of agency and empowerment. So, um, so Harkin is one. Another one is the Trusting News Project by Joy Meyer here. Um, in, it also, again, is focused in the States, but has worked elsewhere. Uh, one that is global is uh, the Solutions Jour Journalism Network, which is a nonprofit that does very cool work helping to train journalists to cover communities' attempts to solve problems instead of just the problem. Um, and that is, again, a way to influence uh, government and political will that is much more psychologically informed. We know from decades of research that when people feel like there is no hope, they do a couple of things. They give up, they start avoiding the news. And we see this with climate change, right? Um, a lot. And, and they eventually become very cynical or seek out different sources of information that feel better, uh, whether they're true or not. 
right? So this is not a great situation. <laughs> um, and then if it turns out, this is really cool, if you do good journalism around attempts to solve problems, so solutions journalism, if you do it well, people are much more engaged in it than problem journalism. Because at this point, problem journalism, the traditional kind, is cliche. Like it's actually not interesting anymore because we know what it's going to say. Um, so there was a study by Smith Geiger, which is a big media research firm here in the States where they did side by sides. They had, they had a traditional problem story uh, from local TV news and a solution story. Now, let me just pause to say this, the solution story doesn't have to have a happy ending. Like it doesn't have to have worked. <laughs> and this is where you get into a more interesting definition of conflict. You know, conflict is an important driver of interest, but it can be internal conflict. It can be all kinds of conflict that we don't always think of in traditional journalism. So if a community tries to solve a problem and it doesn't work, if there's unintended consequences, that is actually really interesting, but it still shows some agency, right? Um, and what you find in the Smith Geiger study is that audiences of real people were far more engaged in the solution stories than in the problem stories. Um, and that was across every demographic, race, age, gender, even political uh, affiliation, which is a big deal because you usually um, don't see that kind of universal uh, uh, positive reaction to, to news. Um, so, so those are just some more tangible examples of places that are intentionally trying to build. I mean, they, journalists wouldn't call it political will probably because uh, it, that would feel like a, a conflict with our professional identity, um, but a sense of community, connection to your audience, agency, perspective, hope, all of those things are missing from traditional journalism, and a lot of journalists do feel that, um, and some of them are doing something about it. Thank you, Amanda. That's very interesting. That's uh, very uh, straightforward, but, but deep insight that uh, if, if the media simply shares uh solutions or the attempt to find solutions even where unsuccessful it uh, creates a completely different orientation uh for the uh the, the the audience as well and the audience in fact is no longer an audience they are they are themselves protagonists and i, I know that from the perspective of the the baha'i international community and, and baha'is around around the world uh the notion that everybody can play an active role everybody has a role to play in, in the their individual and their community uh, the, the progress of themselves as individuals and the, the progress of their communities. This is a fundamental truth that uh, that Baha'is try to put forward. And uh, and if the media reflects uh, a vision of people being active participants and protagonists and playing a role, then people will see that and they'll try to play that role because that's what's being shown to them. And if uh, if they simply see people being criticized uh, and and uh, being told that they're failing uh, or that they're in the wrong, then obviously they don't want to be labeled to those things, so they will opt out. So I, I think the kind of the, 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 the core insight there about, about human nature and how it's uh, played on either negatively or positively by the media is quite an important insight uh, for us to, to take away there. Um, so thank you for that, that's very interesting. And for anybody who's interested in the projects that Amanda mentioned specifically, we'll try to share those in the coverage of uh, the event after the fact. Um, Nandi, I wonder if you could also please uh, talk a little bit about uh, this issue of, of uh, how the media can, um, uh, how, how this notion of the media can contribute to positive governance. Uh, and, and then also, Temley will ask you the same question. And then I think we'll move on to questions from, from everybody who gathered with us. So what's been shared thus far makes me also want to ask my colleagues, Amanda and Timley as well, what your views are on the journalist as a protagonist. And I ask that because one of the ways that I came into journalism many, many decades ago was that the journalist stands aloof and observes society and objectivity is measured by the degree of aloofness one has. However, I think the, the, the role that Amanda is describing as far as this constructive uh, storytelling actually requires a social agent to be a journalist. That is someone who's actually involved in the life of society. Um, I was thinking for myself that years ago when I was covering child welfare here in Georgia, which had reached a, an abysmal state and the federal government needed to come in and, and intervene. And in addition to covering the number of deaths that were happening for children in foster care, I became a court appointed special advocate. So I took the training 
I went to court, I represented you know, three children, and I covered the story. Now, traditionally in the journalism schools that, that I was in as an undergraduate, that's actually a no-no because you're, you're, you're way too close to the story. But I was thinking about even having read Amanda's book and, and Timely, I think in your work as well, maybe in order for us to really think about uh, the impact of media on governance, we, we can't perhaps stand so aloof from it, but we have to then distinguish between the fact that maybe we are social actors, we're part of our society, but we still have an obligation to search out truth. So I can't just simply say, because I was a court appointed special advocate, the social services system is wrong. And my job as a journalist is to prove to you how wrong this social service, I have to still, as you know, cover objectively what's taking place. So I, I don't know what your experiences have been. I know a little bit about Amanda only because I've, I've read your book, but you know, I don't know, Timoli, for you as well, whether as a journalist being able to in some way engage in the society is also helpful. Yeah, if I can just jump in there. Um, I think it comes back to what I said at the start of, I, I really see journalists as being conscious moral actors. And I think seeing, if you view yourself in that light, then this question of being aloof isn't the dominant question anymore. And I just thought of one example as Amanda was speaking before. I think in contexts where groups and people are very polarized and where the media serves a role in further polarizing society, the journalists can play that key role in building relationships across unlikely people. You become a facilitator of unity amongst different people. And it's got you've got to have a long-term view of that relationship. It's a long-term relationship that you're building. I remember I was speaking to a professor that I wanted to interview and his stance on journalists was that I don't speak to them because they'll take five years of research, reduce it to five words, and that's it. And oftentimes it sows the seed of confusion rather than clarifying any kind of, you know, what his motivation was in doing the kind of research that he did. But um, because of the long-term relationship and the sincerity that the person saw and what my aim was in, in telling the story, they sort of changed and were more willing to speak to different people. And, and through that kind of an approach, I think journalists can be sort of keys in transforming um, a society. Um, and the other thing that came to mind earlier um, when Amanda was speaking is that I feel like a lot of times local communities across the world have more in common. And it's when it's filtered through the lens of sort of the national view that that division is highlighted. But at the level of like, this is my neighborhood, this is my community, these are what we hope to build, this is the kind of life we hope to live together. I feel like there's a lot that people have in common and social media is facilitating that. So not traditional media, um, but social media very much is, is helping to bridge those gaps. And in Southeast Asia, for example, where traditional media like is not really relevant in many rural contexts, it is platforms like WhatsApp that are facilitating calls to action, that are creating sort of networks of collaborative communities that I think traditional journalists won't even see. In Malaysia recently with COVID, for example, there was a, a movement called the white flag movement where people who really couldn't afford food because it's been in lockdown for a long time would just put a white flag out of their front yard, uh, front door, and without questions asked, people who could would donate food to these families. This was all facilitated on WhatsApp, not even Facebook, where you know it's a bit more public. This is on WhatsApp in particular. So it's interesting how some of the new media platforms that we have will actually facilitate connection in new ways that defy sort of traditional media and how they were connecting people. Thank you so much. So uh, there are some very interesting thoughts there on, uh, on, on solutions journalism versus uh, uh, conflict journalism or problem journalism. And then uh, I think Nwandi said some very important uh, points on, uh, on the journalist as somebody who's even an engaged party and activist of sport. And there's a lot for journalists to think about and look at there. And then uh, Temely uh, said, uh, offered some very interesting insights about community and about uh, the way communities organize. Um, and, and you mentioned uh, social media, which I think will take us nicely into our, our question period, because obviously it wouldn't be a discussion on media without some look at social media. And, uh, and Temely, it's, it's great that you mentioned a positive case study of, uh, of WhatsApp being used to organize communities, because one of the questions that has come up a few times in the chat has been around the uh, use uh, of social media or the or the way social media as a space has uh, has led to polarization um, and uh, and uh, the, the spread of, uh, of of news that is not uh, real um, uh, and so on and I think uh, 
the question from the the the, the group, the attendees here, is to, to anybody on the on the panel as to how um, social media, the tendency for these outcomes in social media, can be changed. And I think it might be worth framing that question a little bit from my own understanding. Of course, social media is not monolithic. It's not any one thing. Um, it's, a, it's a space like any other media space and it's shaped by forces um, that are in some cases commercial, in, in many cases algorithmic. Uh, and that's a new a challenge for, for humanity and, and the media specifically to deal with. Uh, so probably a lot of how social media uh, confronts these challenges is the same way any other part of the media does. Um, through some of the qualities that we've been looking at on intention and on uh, looking at solutions rather than problems and so on. But I wonder if anybody has anything specific to say on, on some of these uh, issues that we've been discussing and how they can be uh, pursued also in the space of social media. Uh, perhaps Amanda, if you'd like to start us off there. Yeah, I think it's a good reminder that uh, I think Temely gave us that it's very hard to generalize about news media or social media um, but you can, in the contrast, see the difference that design and rituals make, right? So if you go on some social media sites, there is a spirit of generosity and helpfulness. Um, and then you go on others, and there is, at least it feels like, a much more antagonistic spirit. Um, so we know you can design media to elicit people's healthier conflict instincts or their more adversarial conflict instincts. So then it's like, well, what do they look like? Um, and it's, it's sort of like, I mean, it reminds me of um, where we were, you know, with tobacco 70 years ago, you know, we haven't established the norms and education and understanding about you know, even basic things like how do you persuade? How do you persuade someone? Because <laughs> I think most of our intuition and a lot of our mo role models uh, have no connection to reality. Like how you persuade people is not the way people keep trying to persuade people. Somebody said to me yesterday, I was talking to a, uh, someone who does a lot of de-escalation training and training for having hard conversations and he was saying, you know, we keep trying to have hard conversations with each other without having relationships first. So at some point, we need to try to build relationships, even in adversity, uh, because you really can't have one without the other. Now, that feels hard. Relationships is like a big word, you know, like, oh, my God, I could take forever. Um, a, maybe a better word is uh, another person that I've interviewed um, who does de-escalation training. These, these people are very helpful right now <laughs> is uh, it, he calls it rapport. He said in in a sudden conflict, and this is this is you know maybe a more kind of violent situation, but I think it applies across the board. There's only two things you can do: earn rapport and then use rapport. <laughs> and so you know you have to even if you can't necessarily build a deep relationship with people, especially on social media, you can build rapport. Um, and examples of that and research of what that looks like and more kind of consensus building among users about what that looks like and doesn't look like is to me, I think the most exciting area of growth in, in that whole realm, because it is, I mean, it is a great way. I, I, people DM me all the time. I'm sure you both have this experience uh, on Twitter that probably if they had emailed me, I, I never would have gotten it or if they had written me, you know, I mean, it's just much more, you're, you have more access to different people. And I have met people. I just, you know, spent a long time learning from a public bus driver in Portland, Oregon, about how he deals with sudden conflict on his bus, because he every single day is like doing conflict mediation, right? And he's tried a lot of things that didn't work. <laughs> and then now he's figured out some really cool strategies based on a lot of reading and, and research that he's done, but also trying it out in the real world. So there is something beautiful about, again, shrinking that space, as we were talking about, between the public and the institutions or the producers of media, if you have ground rules in place for how we're gonna engage each other without dehumanizing and degrading each other. Thank you so much. So uh, I think a reminder for, for the norms of human decency, if we're going to, use space like social media. Um, 
Thank you, Nwandi. Uh, uh, Amanda, apologies. Uh, Nwandi, if, uh, if you have anything on uh, social media in particular, I think this point of, uh, you know, I think where Amanda closed uh, uh, ground rules um, or, or, or remembering to treat others as we would like to be treated. Uh, I don't know if you have experience of this in your own work personally, but uh, if you have anything to share on, on how social media could be better uh, could become a more useful space if we simply had some of these, uh, these, if we remembered some of these human qualities when we engaged there? Well, I think one thing is that every time we come up with a new technology, we misunderstand that it, it is just a platform. I often, I remember years ago, people would you know, invite me to be on shows and they would ask me, you know, should we use this or that? Which one of these is less, you know, conflict driven? Which one of these is less adversarial? but they're just platforms. So human beings are storytellers and have always been storytellers. We sat around fires in ancient times. That's how we convey knowledge, period. And one of the reasons, just as an aside, why the United States is faring poorly in math and science with students right now is because it's forgotten that math and science are also stories. And so we, we've reduced them to something that most people can't actually do anything with. In any case, once we realize that it is just that, it's, it's a storytelling um, method and it shouldn't receive some, you know, uh, a, a certain fence around it and, 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 and you know, some, some special designation, rather the same way that you would enter any community. So this idea that has long been accepted, again, we talked about earlier, the fact that if we keep repeating something over and over again, it doesn't mean it's true, but it does become more a part of our reality. So for instance, people have always said since you know, emails and then on into social media and text, it is much easier to blast people from the, this platform than it is you know, if you had to be face to face and that's just an accepted you know, reality, if you will. But is that true or should we think of social media and any other community in the same way that we enter a community? And if I wouldn't walk into your subdivision and begin cursing you out and screaming and yelling, why would I assume that I would greet you on, on social media, as, which is another community in that way? Why wouldn't I be more thoughtful? But I, I, I think that um, as long as we continue to perpetuate certain, um, you know, just the, the, these are impressions about human reality and identity and capacity, and you, you will receive what you, you know, put out there. And of course, the unfortunate piece is that now you have a couple of generations, right? So social media is not new and we have people who have been raised in it. And when they're raised with these certain assumptions and those assumptions, by the way, then begin to impact all storytelling. So we put it out there as social media and then we adopted it in traditional media. The way in which we speak, what is the posture in entering a community, even what makes a good reporter when they arrive in a community physically? Should they be combative? Are they, you know, if I'm getting the story, am I the tough guy and I've come to, you know, take this from you? You're obviously lying. People love to watch that now, but that's, we'll say, well, that's what sells because the elephant in the room about both social media and so called traditional media is money. So they, 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 these things, at least in the West, they're, they're tied very tightly to profit margins. But then we're not actually asking people what it is that they would most like to see. As Amanda pointed out, when we actually test real people and give them options, they select ideas that will guide them to solutions. They don't really want to see things that don't. But we've noticed in media that it's cheaper actually to produce things that, 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 that are very conflict driven, things that we now call reality TV, things that we, you know, these talk shows that at one point were actually journalistic shows, but then they just became people yelling at each other. It's really cheap to produce that. So that's part of the reason that we get a lot of it. And maybe if we were to infuse the system with other assumptions about human nobility, about the capacity of people to advance and to learn. So that if today I have said something and it is has been found to be untrue or maybe what may, maybe I can advance and maybe the idea is not for everyone to tear me up and and you know defame me but rather let's see stories about how people are actually beginning to transform and how they're growing in capacity but you know that that does require collective will even beyond political will for us to to take that that approach Thank you, Nandi. And uh, that, that leads me into a question on this for Timely. Uh, but just before I ask it, I wanted to apologize uh, to everybody because I, I believe there's a technical issue, perhaps on our end. We haven't been able to have Janet so far, um, but I hope we're 
going to be able to include her. So Janet, if you can, oh great, hi there, Janet. Hi, welcome. I'm sorry about the, uh, the, 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 the challenge there, but thank you so much for being with us. Um, so I, I think, uh, Tamily, I'll hold off on, on coming back to you if that's all right. And uh, Janet, if we could uh, maybe uh, bring you into the conversation at this point, we have about uh, 20 or so minutes left. Um, it would be great to, uh, to, to, to hear from you on, on perhaps the, you know, the overarching theme that we've been discussing, I think, is, uh, is this question of the, the intentions of journalists and the way they are able to uh, find an opportunity in the media landscape in which they work to, to do work that, uh, if I can just try to think of how to, 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 to summarize what we've been saying, how to do work that is fundamentally constructive and not simply perpetuating a narrative that has gone before, not using the, uh, the, 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 the kind of the race to the bottom uh, version of the media um, machine that, uh, that simply tells people what they're ready to hear, which might be polarizing or might be uh, somehow uh, not constructive in, in another way. And, uh, and so we know from your background that you've done a lot of work on uh, rural development issues and humanitarian issues in Ghana. And, uh, and that you uh, were uh, awarded for this uh, work, in particular around water security, I believe, in rural areas. And it would be great to, to hear from your experience on how, as a journalist, you tried to uh, advance contributions that were uh, really uh, around, obviously, uncovering important stories, but more importantly than, than simply that act in an isolated sense. Uh, encouraging society to address those uh, important stories. I think that's what we're really looking at here. Not simply the, uh, the, the, the story, but then what society does about the story. So if you're able to speak a bit about, uh, uh, speak to those questions a little bit from your experience, I think we'd all be very interested to hear from you. Okay, hello everyone. Sorry, I'm so sorry I, I got in late. I'm so sorry and I hope I'm forgiven. Please, can you hear me? Yeah, you're coming across fine. Okay. Sorry? We can hear you very well, yes. Please go ahead. Okay. So, practicing as a journalist in Ghana, one of the things I realized is that um, as journalists, our voice goes far. Whatever we put out there, people take it and then they, they believe in it. So, for me, what I saw was that, okay, if what we put out there, people believe in it, then why don't we look at the positive aspect of it? Why don't we give a voice to the things that are not being heard enough and then make a positive change in that area? So I look at, I looked at, I think someone was speaking about the things that pay, um, that people pay attention a lot to. So most people try to create content there to make a lot of um, uh, money also. And so I realized that rural development is something that is much not paid attention to, that is in Ghana. So I said, okay, let me go to that area and report on the issues in the rural development as well as get them help. So when I started doing it, I realized that well, a lot of people were interested. They were asking questions like, wow, is this a community in Ghana or in the world? How, how is that possible that there's a community that drinks from such filthy water and the kind of schools that children are found in, the kind of um, roads they have and everything. People were amazed, especially those in the cities. They were amazed that there were such communities, there were such places. So they were intrigued and wanted to offer help. So whenever I did the stories, they, they come on board to support. But one thing is going to such communities Communities together stories was 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 a big problem because, um, for instance, if I find myself at a national television, there are cameras that operate here at the national television. So ideally, the cameras will be sent to areas in the urban urban places where um, we could easily get stories. So going to the rural areas it becomes difficult. So at the end of the day, I want the story to come out. When I don't find a camera immediately available and I have a deadline for like two weeks to do the story, I have to end up renting a camera to be able to go there. Because on my side, 
I want to get, I'm, I'm passionate about getting the story out and I'm passionate about seeing a change with a story that I want to come up with. So I don't have to wait for a camera to be available. You see, so I'll say like this, these are some of the disadvantages. If I have to wait for my disadvantages to be solved as a journalist, that means always you have the most important stories lacking behind. And uh, the other day I was saying something that one of the things that I realized in Ghana is that a lot of people are going into journalism and most, most people go into journalism with, with a passion that you see, especially when we went to journalism class level 100, most of my colleagues were like, oh, I want to be a journalist because I want to be a voice for the voiceless. But he or she comes out and the job market, the media, the media houses are not readily available. It's just few. And the few too, it is choked. So the person is very good. The, ver the person is very, very good. The person is looking for um, a means you know, the person wants to earn an income to survive. And so if the person is not finding a job, he or she would say, okay, then let me divert. Let me go to another field where I can be able to work and earn an income. So at the end of the day, they drop, they drop, they drop the journalism and then go into other areas. Trust me, I know a lot of very good journalists that I know that if they go ahead to practice and practice very well, will get a lot of change in the world, but they are not practicing because at the end of the day, the income aspect is very important and what they want to communicate to us is also very important. Without an income, how can the journalists survive? So in as much as I blame them for also leaving their job behind, I, I'm, I'm also considerate on the fact that they need an income to be able to survive. So in Ghana, for instance, um, there's, there's a lot of help that needs to come here with regards to funding for journalists, because believe you me, I am from here. I am from here. I practiced journalism and my journalism had about 80% of results. Most of my stories that I did, a, a lot of people were touched by it and they were able to help the people in need. So imagine if everyone is putting in that much effort into every other aspect. For instance, I have taken, um, rural stories and streetism. Imagine another person takes something else, health. Someone takes, um, uh, looks, begins to look at education. Imagine the kind of change we'll be able to do across the world, you get it. So here in Ghana, for instance, that's, that's one major challenge here. I don't know much about other places too, but here, there are very good talents here with regards to journalism, who, who can change a lot of things, but unemployment is one major factor that is pushing them behind. Thank you so much, Janet. So it's very interesting to, to hear that in your experience uh, working as a journalist in Ghana, you feel that in, uh, in looking at uh, certain issues that, that need to be understood, and uh, for example, uh, challenges facing rural communities, and I think in your, your experience, uh, by covering these issues, you're able to, uh, to, to contribute to some progress on these issues in some cases. Uh, and I think uh, yeah. it's interesting to, and, to and look political, at Okay, political wise Please. too. Um, one, one, one major challenge I had from the political aspect too is that, I don't know if it's okay for me to talk on the political aspect. Well, I think it would be interesting to hear about how, uh, how, how you felt society has okay. been able to move a little Poli bit closer to some sort of consensus on those points, yes. Can you come again? I didn't hear that. Sorry, I said, uh, I, I think in terms of uh, your, your question, um, it's, it's what we're trying to understand especially is, because of course everybody on this call is, is familiar that with the, 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 the realities of uh, political difficulties that, ex that exist in all societies. And I think what we're trying to focus on right, right now is the way the media can, 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 can lead to some sort of notion of consensus uh, between individuals and communities and leaders as well. Um, and, and so it's, uh, it, it's less to dwell on some of the realities that we're aware of and more to look at how can the, the media help us move beyond some of these challenges to, uh, to arrive at some kind of consensus between these, think, these core actors. Okay. Yeah, go ahead, please, go ahead. Okay. I think, I think one way that we can, we can all come together to, to make this possible to have, is to have one, one mindset that, okay, this is the goal that we have. 
and this is the target that we have. We, the target is that this is what we want to achieve. You see, the reason being that once we have, we all have the same mindset towards targeting one goal, we are able to work hand in hand to achieve that. But if one person is one person's attention, just as, just as I said earlier, imagine I'm, I'm practicing as a journalist and finances become an issue and there's someone who is willing to give me finances and the person is kind of taming my reportage the kind of the person is deciding the kind of report i should go the, i should go into i it will be very difficult so with regards to fund funding with regards to um idea sharing if we, we can all have a common goal that's okay this is what we are having for journalists i think we a lot of support is not coming in for journalists there are much attacks on journalism more than the support so if we ourselves even within ourselves if we are not coming together if we are not supporting ourselves there is no way we can move forward if everyone is is targeting something else if i'm targeting something else if i want to development and another journalist is interested in something that is just all about um an income or not much into development you will not go anywhere so i think we should all come to a consensus have an agreement that okay uh, we are going to have a great support with this we, so that i mean when we are all okay we will not have any interferences in any way i don't know if thank you yes janet that's very interesting so there are questions of integrity which i think we've we've touched on a, a little bit but i think it would be interesting to to spend the last few minutes thinking about these questions of integrity um and yeah, uh, and yeah. yes yes exactly and uh and and uh, I think we, we we would also so it's it's wonderful to hear from from you and to hear your perspective uh, of working as a journalist um, in Ghana because uh, I think we're very keen in this call to to broaden our perspective from strictly the uh, the, the Western experience uh, and so maybe maybe uh, Temely to, to to that end also you could reflect on your uh, understanding of of uh, the, the the issue of integrity uh, um, and why this is important for journalists and and also how a society can help journalists um, maintain their integrity. I think that yeah. this relationship, uh, you yeah. know, we're, we, we've talked a great deal about the issue of trust. Mm -hmm. And I, I know that Amanda has yeah. spoken about this uh, earlier on the call and also elsewhere, yeah. that if uh, if society can't trust yeah. its media, then that breakdown of trust uh, leads to uh, forms of media that yeah. become uh, polarized or, or, or otherwise problematic. So. Um, Temley, perhaps you could uh, tell us uh, what what you've learned about integrity uh, and and the way this uh, exists um, and is preserved, or or how perhaps that could also be um, uh, how we can improve on that in the in the context that you've worked in. It's gonna be interesting. I was reflecting on what Nwandi was saying and also hearing. We, we should we should we, we should have we should have we should have a lot of support for journalists, honestly, honestly, because um, a lot of support with finances. I'm I'm very key on that because I know that a lot of talent, there are a lot of good journalists here in Ghana. So if journalists across the world, we could all come, we could all come, come together and then advocate for good livelihoods, something that would at least um, support a journalist in, in a way that they, they can have the free will to do their story, to be able to work as, and bring the needed results. I think we all have to come together. And I, I, for instance, I believe we can do it. We just have to come together without having the, the divided attention. Honestly, here they are very. I wish um, we could we could go deeper into into this and then find out exactly what I'm talking about. If we could, or even me as an individual, if I do um, developmental stories and I'm getting results, imagine if we all come together. Imagine the kind of things we can achieve. But if we are divided. Everybody has their own focus. And social media is one big tool that we can use to make the change. Now everybody gets up, the youth, a lot of people, they get up and they're all in the on social media. If imagine they go there, they are finding all the positive stuff. They're finding all the developmental stuff that journalists journalists are up to. They'll they'll pick up from there. Janet, yes, thank you so much. I think we also want to hear from from Temeli's experience in uh, in Hong Kong and Malaysia okay. uh, on okay. these uh, points okay. as well. But no, thank you okay. so much. I think it's very important to uh, to, to, to recognize that uh, support for journalists can come in many different forms and uh, and maybe some societies will think about financial support, some societies will think about other forms of support, but uh, support for the role of, of journalism and the media. Um, and uh, and I think, uh, Tamalee, if you want to speak to that from, from, from your experience, that'd be very helpful. 
Yeah, um, I'll speak. Uh, yeah, a lot of food for insight uh, for insight from all the conversations we've been having today. Nwandi's comments earlier, uh, Janet's experience as a rural reporter. It kind of just is in my mind. I keep thinking of the concept of human dignity and how journalism has a role in advancing that perspective. And I know on sort of a global stage, even at the level of the UN, this concept of human dignity and, and what it is and how it should work in the world is something we're all trying to figure out. Um, there's growing consensus. I understand this from sort of academic research that the language of human rights is sometimes itself polarizing and perhaps human dignity is more basic than that. And we can through the lens of human dignity, seek to build unity in, in new ways. And um, I was just thinking of like, if we view every individual as a dignified being, as a source of insight, how will we treat our sources when we're journalists, but also how we view other journalists who may approach their work very differently from ourselves and work for organizations whose values may not align with our organization, um, how we cross these social boundaries um, I think, you know, if we start to internalize and practice as sort of individual spiritual practice even, and a collective practice of like seeking to manifest dignity, human dignity, and realize it on an individual and collective level, I think that might start to point to um, sort of the future role of both traditional and social media. Um, yeah, and I think, you know, even in, in the context of Southeast Asian rural communities who are not whose stories are not representative are not being told, but who can use, you know, WhatsApp to mobilize and solve their problems. You know, perhaps dignity is the way we can start connecting this story of humanity and it telling us where we are advancing collectively in, in a new way. Thank you so much, Tamily. Uh, so we only have a few minutes left, and uh, it's been a very rich and interesting discussion. We've uh, we've talked about moving from polarization to more consensual or, or consultative forms of media practice, where uh, where the, the 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 form of, of media and reporting is oriented around solutions rather than simply problems, and uh, and in doing this, uh, people who consume the media become uh, perhaps better aware of themselves, playing an active role as uh, as as protagonists, as people who can who can play uh, who can have an effect on their society rather than simply having to suffer through the problems that media is reporting. And in doing this, we've also looked at uh, the experiences beyond the, the Western context of, uh, of, of addressing humanitarian issues, whether it's uh, in, in, uh, in places like Ghana or else around the continent of Africa, whether it's in Southeast Asia. Uh, we haven't been able to uh, include every region in this call um, simply for uh, matters of space and time, um, but they're all there. And, uh, and I think we've also Try to to understand the, uh, the 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 intention of journalists um, in in advancing a form of media that plays this role that plays a, a role that is is more deliberate and deliberative uh, in, in society um, where what we've called political will in, in one space but was really the, uh, the, the 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 impulse towards greater and greater levels of unity in a society where the media can can further that process rather than undermine it or simply not not address it one way or the other. And so I think for my final question to any or all of the panelists, it would be simply to remind ourselves that this has uh, been a wonderful uh, and quite high-minded discussion. And uh, perhaps not all of your colleagues feel the same way all the time. And, uh, and so when you come across uh, skeptics or people who are uh, quite deeply uh, enmeshed in the, in the prevailing norms of your, uh, of, of, your, uh, of your trade or your profession, or even people who are who are out and out conflict entrepreneurs, as Amanda called them, uh, I, I'm curious about how you work with your colleagues, uh, where uh, you're trying to uh, perhaps promote or advance some of the insights that we've been sharing here. How do you try to have constructive conversations within the media with with your colleagues to to get a little further along the the the, the path that we've we've outlined in this discussion? Uh, perhaps uh, we could hear from each of you very very briefly because we only have a couple of minutes left. So. Um, uh, Nwandi, if you'd like to say something briefly about that, please. Well, I think the tool we have at our disposal as journalists is that we are curious, so we ask questions. We are not, um, you know, I, I use the term social actors, very specifically not activists. There isn't a, a will to try to make someone conform to something, but to be deeply curious about it. I think this, um, again, this image of the journalist as someone to be com you know, combated or, and, and who is also combative, 
I, as, as Amanda said earlier, I, I haven't in my experience found that to necessarily be the case, but journalists don't know everything. And so generally speaking, my experience has been to ask the questions about why we're putting a certain image out that way or why we're saying something in this way. And in many cases, my colleagues say, ah, I, I actually never thought of it. It just, it was in the press release. It was said at the press conference. I repeated it. So by not, you know, trying to force someone to do something because I recognize that I have not achieved the highest level of storytelling and, and search for truth either. So being part of a consultative process with my colleagues and I think it enables us to go further. Thank you so much, Nandi. So asking questions, consulting with colleagues, trying to have that, that form of constructive dialogue. Uh, Janet, the, the same question for you, please, but uh, just we only have a couple minutes left. So if you could just say very briefly, how do you try to work with your colleagues to advance um, um, this more principled, more constructive notion of what the uh, of, of the role of media in society, please? You're on mute, by the way, Janet. OK. So the question again, you said, yeah, you want to find out how. How do you talk to your colleagues to try to advance a, a more positive, constructive notion of the, the, the role the media plays? OK, what I try to, whenever we have a conversation on something, I try to make them understand that um, there's a reason that made them, each one of them, want to be a journalist. So they should focus on that reason, that reason, which is wanting to be a voice for the voiceless be one of their major focus. And they should always think of um, the fact that whether they are, whatever they are doing is bringing the needed results that they are looking for. Is society benefiting enough? If that answer is not there, then that means there's a problem. So once they find there's a problem, then they should find ways to, to work on it. And most of them to, one way I'm able to communicate is with them is I show them my results. I show them how powerful the things I am doing individually is bringing results. And so if they should also venture into such things, I mean, we are all collectively going to do great. So that's one best way that I show them. And because they are seeing what I am doing, it's, it's, much, it's enough motivation for them. Yeah. Thank you so much, Janet. Thank you. That's very, I, I think, uh, encouraging that really that boils down to encouragement um i think that's a wonderful virtue to highlight uh, in, in any context including in the media so uh temily and then we'll close with amanda so temily uh, how do you speak to your colleagues about the role that you all play please when i think of colleagues i specifically think of colleagues who work in ways that may not be the way i work yes um and i think uh similar to what Janet said, I think honoring their high-minded intentions for coming, becoming a journalist in the first place is so key to the foundation of the relationship that you build. And oftentimes I find conversations around justice to be very unifying. Most people become journalists to address some issue of injustice in some shape or form. So on that level, I think it's, it's, it's possible to build really high-minded you know, relationships and friendships. But on the other hand, I think just I, two words come to mind, imagination and curiosity. I think that process of imagining together what the world can or should be is a way to bring people together in service of humanity. Thank you, Emily. Amanda, please. Yeah, I think these are all, I'm like taking notes here because these are all, I mean, it's literally walking the walk, right? I mean, we, I can sit around and say how media should be and how people don't understand persuasion and how people treat each other. But then when you have to actually do it, uh, it, it is it is a practice of self awareness and self discipline and uh, compassion uh, and all of those things breathing. <laughs> so asking questions absolutely right trying to get to you know as Janet said the reason you became a journalist and asking asking those questions you know and what is it you love about this job what is it that's hardest for you now in this job what is what is if you were to leave this job. What, why, what would, it, what would be the reason? Um, which piece of it is most painful for you right now? And it's gonna be different for different people in different places. For some places, it's literally, I can't feed my kids, you know? In other places, it's like, I feel like nobody's listening or uh, I'm just adding to the problem or uh, facts don't matter. So there's a lot of pain and a lot of um, hope kind of mingled together in each, person. So accessing that and reminding 
us that we don't actually know all the answers to those questions as much as I, you know, sometimes forget. Um, but I think what I try to do, and I don't always succeed, is, is raise up the examples of people who are doing something different, right? And social media is great for this, you know? Uh, and I do it with politicians too, by the way. Um, so raise up, you know, there's the governor, uh, Asa Hutchinson, a Republican uh, uh, of, he, he recently signed a law that banned a requirement to wear face masks. So any mandate to wear a mask. And now last week he said he regretted it, that he had made a mistake. That's a hard thing for politicians to say, for anyone to say, especially in conflict, in a con high conflict culture. And he said it again and again and again. And every time he's in the room with the reporter, the reporter's like, did you make a mistake? <laughs> and he says, yes, I did. And, but this is awesome. Like, this is what we need. I mean, you know, people need to be able to say they were wrong and, and, and change. Um, so, so trying to raise up those examples, stories that really complicate uh, our stereotypes of one another, I try to raise up and, you know, and I encourage everyone to do this. You know, all of us can write in a note to a reporter and CC their editor who is doing something different, right? Who's doing something that you feel like does bring out dignity, uh, security, hope, the things that we all need as humans to thrive. So write them a note because, you know, they're getting a lot of other feedback, uh, I promise you. And, and so if you can, if you can counterbalance some of that, it is very lonely to be a journalist or a politician trying to do something differently in a lot of places. That's true. Thank you all so much. I think it's a, it's a wonderful place to, to close our discussion. And it's, uh, you know, it, we, we've reminded ourselves that, uh, that the media plays a, a crucial role in our society, if only it, it can do so, whether it's stopping itself or whether other forces are stopping it. And, uh, and that there are some uh, great principles that can orient it, the contribution it makes to, uh, to, to, to its society. And fundamentally, if it remembers that it's uh, a, an institution uh, or a phenomenon that is trying to investigate reality and then to offer that reality uh, impartially and without ego to the service of, of humanity, to the stories of other people, not even to the, the work of journalists, really. Journalists are, are always keen to not be the story, but to the stories of others. Then it can contribute to the kind of process uh, that uh, that creates uh, some movement towards unity and uh, and shared understanding that we need to see in the world. So that's that's what I, I think I learned from all of you today. Thank you so much for your uh, for your time and uh, thank you everybody for joining and for your questions and good afternoon, uh, good luck and goodbye. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank yeah, you. Oh, thank you amazing. <laughs> Thanks so much. Yeah, I thank You're you. Welcome.